I don't know, maybe sensitive is not the right word for this, <laughs> for this evening sermon. Maybe you just have to have a little thick skin for this one. Uh, so we're talking about um, separation. Uh, with this ba- In our Baptist Basic Series, we're talking about separation last week. Last week we had a sermon on separation, who we should separate from, um, what separation is, you know, why separate um, in our lives. But all from the perspective, and I kind of pulled a fast one on you because I'm going to finish out this idea of separation this evening, all from the perspective last week of separating from the unsaved, separating from unbelievers. Okay, tonight, tonight, we're going to look at the perspective of separation from the saved, separating from believers. And you're like, what? You're like, last week was bad enough. You know, I mean, you're telling me that there's some believers in our lives that we need to separate from, and that is exactly what the Bible teaches. Now, this Baptist Basic Sermon, this is a great sermon series for um, newcomers to Verity Baptist Church. So please join us for all these sermons. But look, this is one of the things that we're going to talk about tonight that you're probably not going to hear at many other churches. Because look, this is a biblically run church here. If it's in the Bible, that's what we're going to do here. Okay? So look, um, let's look into this idea of separation from believers. You're saying, you know, our brothers and sisters in Christ. Yes, the Bible does teach that in some cases there needs to be separation from believers as well. So look, failing here actually in some ways can be more dangerous for a Christian than last week's sermon. So let's look into it. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We just read it. The context of it is a a church member, a brother in Christ who is in fornication. That is the context of this letter that Paul is writing here. You know, what is taking place? Go look back at verse number 1 and verse number 2 of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. The Bible says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that ye have done this deed, that he that done this deed might be taken away from you. So not to get it too into detail on, you know, the, the situation with the father's wife, you know, whether the father was still alive or not, you know, we don't know. But there, look, you have somebody in fornication here, the Bible says. Okay? You have somebody that's in the church in fornication in a physical relationship with someone that they are not married to. And the Bible says in verse number 2 that he that done this deed, I mean, Paul is saying here what to do. He's telling them what to do. They need to be taken away from you, that person. It doesn't say that this person isn't saved. It doesn't say that this person isn't going to heaven. It just says they're in this wicked sin, and they need to be taken away from you. And then he explains why in this verse. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And look down at verse number 11. Now, we did a whole sermon series on this. We did a whole sermon series on 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 11 specifically on reasons that people would be, you know, that church discipline would be exercised against somebody. Meaning, somebody would actually be taken out of the church or asked to not come back to the church anymore. Look at 1 Corinthians 5.11. So we have the context of this man in fornication. And then Paul says he should be taken away from them. And then Paul gives, you know, other specific sins that, you know, fall under the same category where that, you know, that type of person that's in these sins should also, you know, be taken away. Now look at uh, verse 11. But now I've written unto you to not keep company. Look, that means not hanging out with, not being around, not fellowshipping with. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, with such an one, know not to eat. So this is the, the context, once again, is someone that you're going to church with. Okay? Now, if somebody, obviously, I've explained this before, this says, says, you know, somebody that's called a brother. So the mechanics of this, if somebody comes to the church and they're living, you know, with their, you know, someone they're not married, with, married to, you know, then obviously by the time they get involved in the church and they understand the church and they're called a brother, um, they're in fellowship with the church. At that point, they're going to be given some options. And this has happened here. They're going to be given some options. Either they have to stop that living situation, they have to get married, or they have to not come to church here anymore. Because 
what, you say that's mean. That's what the Bible says. I don't care how mean it sounds. I don't care what anybody thinks. I care what the Word of God says. That's what I care. So, I mean, and you think about, and the, the Bible here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 actually gives us very good reasons why this is here. The Bible doesn't just say, just do this. It gives us actual reasons for this. And look, the reasons, the reasons for it are, are, are for you and for the person that's in sin. Look at uh, verse number 5. The first reason is this. I mean, why? You have someone in fornication. Why would you be so mean as to, you know, kick them out of a church for that? Well, the first reason is in verse number 5. The first reason is for that person. Is actually, it's loving for that person to do that. And why? Look, to deliver such an one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Look, it doesn't say that, you know, they're going to go to hell. It says, look, to deliver them out to the world so they can suffer the consequences of their sin. That's what it says. It's, look, the goal of 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is that the person would get right. Is that the person would get out of sin. And look, if, if churches, if Christianity today would actually practice what the Bible teaches to practice, people's lives would be saved, quite literally. It doesn't say, you know, to destroy their soul. It says, or to take away their salvation. It says, just so they can suffer the physical consequences of their sin. And they can get right. Look, they can suffer chastisement from the Lord and get right. And be, look, and be restored. And be restored unto fellowship. That is the goal. That is the most loving thing you could do for a brother and sister. There's another reason, though. Look at verse number 6. Look at verse number 6. There's another reason that all of these sins in 1 Corinthians 5, verse number 11, are to not be tolerated in the church. Now look around here. Look around here at all the kids in this church. Look at all the little kids in this church and all the, you know, this is a family integrated church. These kids, they're listening to the preaching of the Bible here. We're reading the Bible. These kids are hearing the Word of God. They're learning the Word of God. They're getting saved. And then they're living the Word of God. I mean, I'm sitting up here and I'm yelling and I'm screaming at the adults and the children. But, look at verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. You know what he's saying here? He's like, look, sin spreads. Sin spreads like leaven, like a fungus, is what he's saying. So if you're around sin, especially in the church, you become, you'll become desensitized to it. I mean, I've preached entire sermons on fornication and the dangers of fornication, and how fornication is sinning against your own body, and how God you know, you know, wants you know, all these kids to grow up and, and to be pure when they go to their wedding day, and you know, that fornication will ruin their lives, will ruin the lives of, their, of, of other people, and it, it's terrible. But then, so I preach all this, and then we got a bunch of people in the church that are just in fornication, and everybody knows it. What a joke. It makes a joke of me. It makes a joke of the Word of God. I mean, forget me. It makes a joke. I mean, these kids will grow up and they will think, yeah, you know, I, I hear what he's saying, but look what they're doing here. Kids are not stupid. Okay, kids are smart. That's why the family integrated church, that's why the Bible teaches that the kids should hear the Word of God. Because you know what? These kids understand way more than a lot of people give them credit for at a way younger age. And I've said it before, I'll say it again. What we do is way more important than what we say. So we will have a biblical church here. And it's not because I want it this way. It's because the Bible says it, and that's what we're going to do. So this is talking about, for two reasons, this person is to be put out of the church. And so, I mean, this is, all, this is nothing new to most of you who have been here. We've done a whole um, sermon series on it. So how does it apply to separation? This means very simply this. If someone is put out of the church for one of these reasons... Listen carefully. You are not to continue fellowshipping with them. If somebody is put out of the church for fornication or drunkenness or whatever, a believer, someone is called a brother, you're not to just, okay, they just can't come to church, but we're all just going to hang out with them anyway. That's not what the Bible teaches. Look, you're not to keep company with them, the Bible says. Verse number 11. I mean, look, church discipline is one thing. But, I mean... 
if you, if you try to you know, run around church discipline and you still just have that same relationship with that person that's not even allowed to come to church anymore, look, you're standing in the way of God's chastisement on that person. And that's not, look, good luck with that. That's not where you want to be. But wait, there's more. So we're talking about you know, separating from somebody who would be in those specific sins and get removed from the church. Hopefully to be restored. Okay, Hopefully to be restored, to, to, to get away from that sin. To get that sin out of their life and to, to be back in fellowship where they should be. Where all believers should be. But there's more. Turn to 2, Corinthians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. That's someone who's thrown out of the church. We are to separate from them. If they were thrown out of the church, you know, I mean, thrown out is maybe a, a, tough, a tough term. You know, they've been removed from fellowship. You know, does that make you feel better? Removed from fellowship of the congregation. For the protection, for number one, to get them right and to protect the church itself. Okay, look, if we, if we want to have a church like Jesus said that the gates of hell will not prevail against, we better follow his rules is what it boils down to. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Look, there's more. It's not just someone who's been removed from fellowship. There's more believers that you may have to separate from in your life. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says this. It says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly. Just underline that in your Bible. Working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. So this is talking about somebody who's not working. Look, that's just the beginning of it. They're, they're not working. And what happens? They, they, get into, they get into disorderly conduct. And it's somebody who's not working. They're just getting into disorderly conduct. But then look at verse number 14. And any, if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy. Like, look, he's not, he's not your enemy. Don't hate him. It's the same thing with the guy that gets, you know, the guy or the, the gal or whatever that gets put out of the church for those specific sins in 1 Corinthians 5. Look, don't hate them. They're your brother. They're your sister. You know, pray for them. Pray that, you know, pray that they get right. Pray that you know, they can be restored. It's the same thing here. Look, this is the same exact concept as 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is what we're dealing with him. Count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So here, he, he's a believer. He's saved. But look, stemming from the fact that they don't work and they've gotten into disorderly conduct, we are commanded to separate from them. I mean, first of all, let me just, you know, park it here for a minute. You know, if you've ever heard the, the term, the idle, idle hands or the devil's workshop, it's talking about 2 second, second Thessalonians chapter 3. That's where that came from. Okay, that wisdom came from the Bible. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Let me just park it here for a minute and just look at the root of this problem. You know, people that don't work, and look, you will find plenty of saved people that are like this. Unfortunately, I'm sorry to report it, but look, people that don't work, you'll find plenty of saved people, you know, men that are just constantly on unemployment or constantly finding ways to not work. I mean, look, you will find saved people like this. But there's more, I mean, women as well. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, look at verse number 8. 1 Timothy 5, 8, I've read this many times. But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. That's a, that's a bad verse if you don't work. Let not a widow, but then it continues, let not a widow be taken in under threescore years old. That's 60 years old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works. If she had brought up children, she had lodged strangers, she had washed the saints' feet, if she had relieved the afflicted, if she had diligently followed every good work. But the younger widows refuse. For when they, when they begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. So basically, it's talking about you know, the, the unmarried women that are not to be taken in. I mean, if you're under 60, you're supposed to just get married, having damnation because they cast off their first faith. Now look at verse 13. 
It's the same thing as 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 is what happens here. And withal, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers, and here it is again, busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. It's the exact same thing on the women's side for 2 Timothy chapter 3. So basically, if you're a woman, you're under 60, you're not living with your parents, the Bible says you should get married. And certainly not supported, and you say, well, there's no one to marry. Well, that's another sermon in itself. But, I mean, certainly not supported by the church, you know, to support yourself. Or, or the Bible says, you'll cause trouble. Now look, with men and women, this is almost, look, men and women, especially men, I've seen it the most, that just will not work, it is like a guarantee. They are going to cause trouble. I, I don't, you know, it's almost like the Bible's true. You know, but every single time, as a matter of fact, I tried to think of a time, I tried to think of a time when I was writing this sermon that, that there was someone in the church that I could think about that didn't work, and they didn't cause trouble, and I couldn't think of one. I couldn't think of one. Every single time that there is idle hands, uh, a, a man that won't work in the church, that did not work, they, they, they just caused trouble. Every time. So while working is the root cause, the main problem is what? The main, you know, not working is the root cause. The main problem is, you know, they become busybodies. They're walking disorderly. What does that mean? That means they're, you know, they're, they're getting into sin. They're getting into sins. It says don't eat with that person. Don't keep company with that person. Look, those people... You know, and for the same reason as 1 Corinthians chapter 5, they'll drag you into it. They will drag you into trouble. So here's a, here's a test for you. Here's a test for you. If there is someone that you could think of in your life that, you know, they're saved, you're like, you know, they're saved, no problem, but they just like, they just constantly are just putting resistance on you, on the things of, of your spiritual life, to do spiritual things, to go to church, to go soul winning, to, you know, fellowship, you know, with believers. Look, here's the thing with backslidden people, folks. It's like, they don't like other people outgrowing them. I've seen this so many times. Backslidden people don't like getting past. They like everybody else to stay where they are. And this is what it's talking about in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Look, so they want you to, no, 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 stay, stay where I'm at. Don't, don't outgrow me. So they'll discourage spiritual things. So the Bible's telling you to watch for this. You know, the Bible calls this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, calls it leaven. It calls it leaven that spreads through the church. You know, so we're to watch out for this. Backsliding can spread. Be careful with this. And usually, you know what? And, and, it's, and it's 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It just... It just tax right on 1 Corinthians chapter 5, because guess what? Almost every single time I can think about it, it's the same sins. <laughs> it's, the, it's almost like the Bible knew what it was talking about when it listed those specific sins in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Almost every time, it's fornication, it's drunkenness, it's idle hands, people not working, those things right there. I mean, you see this stuff amongst believers, folks. So when you see it, you may have to separate if it is dragging you down. For, look, for you and for them. Both. Turn to Numbers chapter 16. Look, I mean, look, if you have a, a friend, say you have a good friend. You have a good friend that just like, you know, you're in this Christian life and you guys are just killing it together. And all of a sudden, you know, you just like, you, you just keep growing and for whatever reason, they just start backing out of the Christian life. Look, look, they're not, it's not that they're, they're not losing their salvation, they're still going to be in heaven with you, all that, but look, in this life on this earth, it's, I mean, they're probably not, either they're not growing as fast as you, usually though, one of them turns and goes the other way. Because in this Christian life, what I've seen is you're either going forwards or you're going backwards. There's very few times where you'll see somebody like, you know, just trying to put it in cruise control. You're either growing or you're backsliding. That's kind of how it is. That's kind of what you'll see with the, you know, the pragmatics of it. Look at Numbers chapter 16. But here's the thing. With that friend of yours that just gets backslidden and you're growing, don't you want them to get right? 
I mean, who in the world would have a Christian brother or a Christian sister, you know, in Christ that they would love to just see fall in sin and just ruin this life? I mean, so look, you've got to let God's chastisement work. Look, God, they're saved. God's their Heavenly Father. He's going to take care of it. Don't you get in the way of it. Look at Numbers chapter 16. Look at verse 25. Look what the Bible says. And Moses rose up and went unto Datham and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents and their wives and their sons and their little children. He's like, look, just get away from them. Look, he's talking to saved people here. Here's these wicked people, and he's telling the saved people, just get, just get away. Why? Because you're going to get sucked into their sins. You're going to get dragged into their sins. So the first thing is, you want your friend to get right. You want your friend to, to do something in his life to keep plowing in his Christian life. You want him to get right. Step out of the way and let God handle it. And don't stand in the way of God's chastisement. Don't try to make it better for them. That's why you know, you're supposed to just separate from them for that time, at least. Same thing as 1 Corinthians chapter 5. But the second thing is, you don't want to be near those people when the missiles start raining down. I, I mean, you know... The earth swallowed these people up and the people that were around them, too, in Numbers chapter 16. But look, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 is not just about people. I just want to get this point across very carefully. It is not just about people getting thrown out of church. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 is one of the most consistently demonstrated concepts in the Bible from my perspective. Because it is just a guarantee. And if you're par it, it, look, and if you're paying attention in this Christian life, it's fairly easy to recognize people that are dragging you down in your Christian life. It's fairly easy. If you want to recognize it, you will. Are these people that I'm around right now making me more or less spiritual? And trace it back, and you will find yourself a backslidden believer right there. Someone that's wrapped up in the four things that we talked about this morning. That's wrapped up in, in covetousness. That's wrapped up in just, you know, some sin. Drunkenness, fornication, not working. You know, that's wrapped up in false teaching. You know, Romans 16. Separate yourself. You know, get, get away from people that are teaching different doctrines. You know, maybe they're teaching some, you know, maybe they're saved and they're teaching some weird stuff. Look, it, it happens. It happens. Maybe they get some stupid idea that they want to go spread around. Look, stay away from that. That's what the Bible's telling us. And then youthful, I mean, youthful foolishness. Maybe they're just foolish. It's possible. Or just, you know, watch, your, watch out for backslidden buddies is what I'm trying to get you to, to understand. Recognize it and stay away from it. So, there could be people in the church that get removed from the church. You're supposed to separate from those people. That's an easy one. You'll see that. You'll see the mechanics of that happening. You don't have to do anything because you'll see that happen. You'll see that happen. Recognize it. But look, that, you know, it's a little bit more complicated when you look at somebody who's backslidden. So you kind of have to be checking yourself here. You kind of have to be checking yourself. Look, is, is this, for some reason, I'm just, I'm just not feeling positive about church anymore. I'm not just, you know, I don't want to go. I don't want to go soul winning anymore. I don't want to do this thing. You know, recognize if there's somebody that's causing that. Okay, that's causing you to stumble and stay away from it, is what the Bible is saying. Okay, so we see, folks, that there you have it. There is some believers. There is some times where you will need to separate from believers. So there you have it, folks. We need to withdraw from all fellowship with unbelievers. We need to stay away from all believers that are in sin, that are walking disorderly. Let's form a commune and move to Idaho or North Dakota or whatever, you know, except this, actually. Turn to John chapter 17. <laughs> oh, pastor warned you about this. Here it is. I should have waited a couple more months before I dropped this one on you. No, 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 no. Except this, okay? Except this. Except this. Look at John chapter 17. 
I have to just, I've just got to like, I, I mean, I can't hang around anybody but these people that are right here right now. Except this. Look at John 17 and verse 14. Look at what Jesus says. I've given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou should take them out of the world, but that thou should keep them from evil. Jesus is praying here. Okay? And he says, look, he says, I don't want you to take, he's talking about disciples, that he's armed with his word. Look, hey, that's us. Okay? He's talking about his disciples, his ambassadors, that he's armed with his word. And he prays to God and he says, I pray. He's like, God, don't take them out of the world. He says, don't take them out of the world, but, but this, but that thou should keep them from evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through tr thy truth, thy word is truth. And as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I will sanctify myself that they may also be sanctified through the truth. So verse number 15 here is the reason for this separation doctrine. Okay, you wonder, what's the reason for all these, all this, this, these two sermons that I just preached? What's the reason? The reason is verse number 15. It's to keep us from evil. Because we're going to be in the world. But we want to be kept from evil, kept from harm. Okay? The easiest, look, the easiest solution to be kept from the harm of the world would be to just completely withdraw from the world. And look, some, you know, some people do. I remember uh, growing up and around my wife's, uh, my wife's ranch that she grew up in, a couple miles away, there's a big commune of this just religious sect. I don't even know what they believe, but it's, I'm sure it's not the right thing, but you know, they, they, they just withdrew from the world. And it's these, you know, 20 houses or whatever, and these people all just live out in the middle. Look, people do this. I was joking about it. People do it. There's all these little communes all over, you know, North Dakota. There's, there's, there's a lot of them. But the problem is what Jesus says is that we're supposed to be in the world. In verse 18, we've been actually sent into the world. We've been actually been sent. Look, these lessons on separation and fellowship is they're pragmatic instructions on how to keep us from evil while we are in it. While we're in the world. Doing what? Well, preaching the gospel. Getting other people saved. How are people going to get saved if the people, the only people that know the, the, the gospel are living on a mountain in Idaho? Or, you know, in a field in North Dakota. I mean, how's that going to work? That's not how it's supposed to work. Okay, look, men, look, men, you have to go out and work in the world. Look, we have to go out and work with unbelievers. But that doesn't mean that we fellowship with them, that we're hanging out with them, all this. But now, just to put a bow, so we're not supposed to withdraw from the world, okay? So you're saying, okay, so there's the separation from believers and there's separation from unbelievers, but I have to be in the world? You're like, how's this work? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain it to you. I'm going to explain it, the mechanics of it. I'm going to explain how it looks. Okay, so first thing, I want to give you two points on you know, how, how the mechanics of separation should work in your life. Okay, the first thing is this. It's tied separation and your separation from unbelievers, and then, you know, in certain cases, believers, it's tied to your maturity. It's tied to your Christian growth. Okay? I mean, someone that just gets in church, you know, they just got saved, you know, they're not going to want to go and just, like, cut off their whole family and everyone they've ever met after they get in church for five minutes. You know, I mean, that's... It's tied to grow... Because first, once somebody gets saved... And once somebody gets in church, look, there's opportunity there. There's opportunity to preach the gospel to the people that they know. There's opportunity to, to, what, to be an influence to them. There's opportunity. But what you'll find in Luke chapter 9, I'll just read it for you. In verse number 62. This was from the, the first sermon. In Luke chapter 9, verse 62, Jesus said unto him, No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. He's like, if you want to, what you'll find, and this is why Jesus said this, if you want to put your hand to the plow, 
If you want to put the hand, your hand to the plow in this Christian life, you want to grow and you want to mature, separation is going to be necessary. That is what you're going to find. Because one can't happen without the other. And you can think that you're going to make it happen, and you can think that you can have one foot here and one foot there, but look, Jesus is telling you, and I'm telling you, that it's not going to work. You can't plow and look back at the same time. You can't do it. Meaning, you can't grow unless this separation at least begins to happen in your life and those steps need to be taken. Look, you're going you're gonna to keep up, you're going to keep up all those, here's what's going to happen, you're going to keep up all those world, and these this stages you're probably all going to go through. You're like, you know what, I got saved, I'm in church, um, I preached the gospel to some people, some got saved, some didn't. I'm just going to keep up all these worldly relationships. And then what it's going to do is it's going to stall out your growth. That's what will happen. This is why you see, this is why you'll see so many mature Christians. And they all have the same stories. They all have the same stories of separation. Because they got to be mature Christians because they went through that separation process. Okay? I mean, look, they've had those uncomfortable conversations. They've preached the gospel and had people not accept the gospel. Then they, then they were like, okay, okay, we're going to still go to this stuff, but we're going to separate from the sin of it. They've gone through that step. We're going to go to the, the Thanksgiving thing and the wedding, but we're just not going to... We're just not, we're going to keep the people, we're going to leave the sin. That's what we're going to do. We'll go to the wedding, but we're not going to drink. And then, you know, I mean, we're just going to leave before everyone's drunk at that event or whatever. Look, they've all gone through all these things. They've compromised their standards just to keep the peace in certain relationships. Finally realizing, as I said last week, you know, what's the point of this? There's no fellowship here anyway. What's the point of this? And then, step two is they decide, you know, I'm going to put my hand back to the plow. But that whole time where they were like doing this one foot in and all oh, this, you just, you just wasted time. They, they did not grow. They did not grow. So then they decide, you know what? Well, first of all, the cycle I just mentioned to you, years can be spent in that cycle. Years of people's lives can be spent in that cycle. Just not growing, trying to keep one foot in over here, and, you know, then, you know, maybe they decide, you know, hopefully they decide finally to just put the hand back to the plow and, and just get moving in their Christian life. But the, look, the, fa the fact is this, folks, and the, the reason I said it's tied to maturity, it's directly proportional to maturity, is that the better at this that you can do, the better, at, the better you become at this separation that we talked about last week and this week, the more you will grow and the faster you will grow. The more, look, the more, the more you will plow in your Christian life. Think about that. Think about that. And look, I mean, if I... If I came up, I mean, if somebody just came to this church, they, we just went out, we got somebody, you know, saved, and they visited the church, and I just, like, told them my story, like, the first time they came to church, they would just be, they would be, like, blown away. They would be like, are you kidding? I mean, if I told them about, you know, the separation, about the moves, I mean, it would sound ex extreme to somebody like that. I know it would, but for, mature, but for mature Christians, it's just another story. It's just another of the same story, is all it is. Because, because the mature Christian knows, the mature Christian that is in this life, and they're like, you know what, my hand is on the plow, and I'm going forward, they know that nothing gets in the way of their, of their plowing. They're not going to allow anything to get in the way of their growth. And that is somebody who is going to be extremely productive in their Christian life. So, look, it, it's a, I mean, are you, are you following me here? It's a little bit of a chicken and an egg situation. I mean, growth, growth in your Christian life will spur separation as a natural process. Okay? But look, 
I mean, from the, I mean, from the unsaved and from the saved. So growth will spur that separation. But with, without that separation, the growth will stall. It, it will stop. As you hold on to those things, as you, just, as you, can't, as you can't do what you know you're supposed to do. Because look, you know, what will happen is you'll, you'll gain the knowledge. You'll gain the knowledge and you'll know what you're supposed to do. And then you just won't do it. You'll just hold on to those things. You just hold on to those relationships. Look, that friendship with the world will become enmity towards God and you will stop growing in your Christian life. That's what will happen. It's, it, it's just it's tied. It will stall you out. And look, and if you get backslidden, it could cause chastisement. You can't plow looking backwards. Jesus knew what he was talking about. Imagine that. So look, the reality of it is this, folks. The reality of it is this. You get, you get saved, and then there's this honeymoon period. That's what I call it. There's this honeymoon period where all oh, we, we got saved. I'm going to tell everybody that I know this is the greatest thing ever. I mean, we all got saved. We all had that feeling this is the best thing ever. I mean, hello, it's free. Anybody could have it. We go out and you preach the gospel or you attempt to in your, your, your infancy of your Christian life. You probably mess it up a few times. You probably wish you know, that you would have you know, been a little more mature before you tried to lay the gospel on people in a lot of situations. But there's this honeymoon period where you're out there and you're preaching the gospel and then you, know, you realize that okay, some peop most people aren't really accepting this for some weird reason. I don't know why. Most people aren't accepting it. Then you're like, okay, but we're separating from all this sin. We're not doing this stuff in our house anymore. You go through the, the sin separation period, and then you know what? You're going to end up with... Here, here's what's funny. You go through the sin separation period, and then you know a lot of people will separate from you. <laughs> you, know, you, you might not have to separate from everybody you thought you were going to have to, because as soon as people realize that you know what, you're not into everything that they're into anymore, and you're not going to just validate all their sin, you know, they're going to feel like you're judging them or whatever. When, you know, I mean, I, you know, you're judging. No, I just don't want to do that. You, you know, you think you're better than everybody? Yeah, right. You know, I mean, then you're like, okay, well, what's the point of this fellowship? I mean, then it just becomes silly. Because a lot of times you'll realize with these people that, you know, it, it's really about the influence people thought that they had over you. And then when people realize that they don't have that influence over you or your kids anymore, they don't want fellowship. You know, and once they realize that, they'll separate from you. You might not have to do anything. The last thing I want to say is this. The last thing I want to say is this. Everybody's going to go through these same cycles. It's, it's all tied to how fast you want to grow. The last thing I want to say to you is this. It's complicated. I have to sit here and I have to write two sermons like this um, with a church full of people. And some people are baby Christians, some people are teenage Christians, and some people are mature Christians. I mean, how do you write a sermon and apply it you know, to people that are at all different stages of growth in their Christian life? It's difficult to do. So what I want to, I want to throw this out there and I want to just say, look, every case is different. You, know, you should ask advice about this. If you have specific cases, you know, you should pull me aside, you should ask advice to my wife, and you should say, hey, what do you think about this situation? Or what do you think? About Look, ask advice about this. Uh, you know, I have a lot of experience in this area, actually. But ask advice about it because most, and, and most cases are very easy. Most cases are very easy to discern, but feel free, please, to ask advice about it because you're all at different stages of your Christian life. So in case, but these principles, but these principles here, folks, they apply to everyone. They apply to every single one of you. So I encourage you to ask questions if you, if you have questions. But generally, generally, let me say it again, as you grow and mature, you will separate. Okay, it will happen. If you do not separate, you will not grow and mature. I mean, that, you know, that's it. That's the crux of it. And to me, look, to me, you know, especially to me, maybe I got saved in my 30s, you know, maybe, uh, you know, other people that got saved later in life, you know, I don't know about you, but we, I mean, in my perspective, we don't have much time here. 
That's kind of where I'm at in my life. I don't feel like I have much time here. I wasted a lot of time. And I want to get moving as fast as possible. I don't want to waste time. I don't want to waste time in my Christian life. And if, if look, and, and this, is a, this is an especially dumb one. Because in cases where I dragged my feet where I shouldn't have, I knew what the right thing to do was. I knew it. I knew it as clear as the hand in front of me. I knew what to do. But it's just, you know, it's just, it's just difficult to do sometimes. But look, I mean, there's not a lot of time to waste here. And we've got, I mean, that, that's my perspective. I'm trying to make the most of my little vapor on, on this earth. And, and you know, ma many of you, you know, you know, like myself, maybe we feel like we have to make up for lost time. I wasted a lot of time in my life chasing the wrong things. I wasted a lot of time in my life, you know, not plowing for Jesus. So, I'm figuring out what the Bible says, and I'm doing it. And, you know, if that offends some people along the way, whatever. That's why, you know, this church, this church, as we go through this, this doctrinal series, it doesn't really matter where you came from, the church, the, what, the way you did it before, and all this kind of stuff. We're just going to do it this way. And, I mean, by my last breath, we're going to do it this way. And, and that, I mean, that's kind of, you want to grow fast? You want to grow fast and you want to use the time that you have left on this earth, you know, the, the pouring the glass of water on the ground. Boop, that's your life. You want to use that as much as possible. Just, just do what you know you're supposed to do. Just make those decisions. Make those decisions. If you, look, sin can keep you for years. Sin can grab you and take you away from the Christian life. Uh, 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 a brother, a sister in Christ can pull you away from the Christian life and derail you for years. Seen it happen. Just be careful. Do what you're supposed to do. And, and, and that is how you will use the most out of this Christian life. It's really up to you. You know, you're saying, oh, what should I do? Ask questions in certain situations, and, and I'm, I'll, be happy to, I'll be happy to give you biblical advice on that. But I'm not for wasting time, because we don't have a lot of it. We don't have a lot of it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.